Hi everyone, Nemo here. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another live stream where today I'm going to be taking a look at what some call the 13th Apostle, C.S. Lewis. We're going to be having a look at some of his work and how it aligns with Mormonism, how it has influenced Mormonism. And I say we because I'm joined by a special guest, someone that you will have seen before if you have watched this channel. But let's bring her on and unmute her so she can say hi. Aloha! Hi. Aloha from, this is... My name? Yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Laura. I'm also known as Sorta Mormon on uh, TikTok. So some there's some small fraction of post Mormons who have already been exposed to mm -hmm. all my Excellent. my raves about C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> so I take you talk about C.S. Lewis on there then. I guess I haven't mentioned him by name, but a lot of my thinking about uh, post Mormonism and about the comparison between the way that the Mormon Church conducts itself and mainstream Christianity, or like the kind of the heart of Christianity, is very mm -hmm. inspired by C.S. Lewis. There we go. So before we dive into C.S. Lewis, the wonderful world of C.S. Lewis, um, I just want to take a moment to remind you all that Thrive in Berlin is coming up. So if any of you are in Germany, or particularly in Berlin, you happen to be in Berlin in two weeks' time, on the 26th, you can come to Mauer Park and come say hi to me, and we're going to hold a Thrive event. It's going to be a free event. People are going to get together in the park. We're going to chat. We're going to get to know each other. We're going to share our experiences. We're going to build up some community. So... Even if you fancy driving from another part of Europe, you're near the Polish border, come on over. It's not just for Germans. Anyone who wants to come over, feel free to come join us. So that's my little shameless plug on Thrive there. I'm really excited for it. So to C.S. Lewis, the man of the hour. Okay, I'm just going to put this up on here. Oh, let me do it that way. Does that we work? have some oh. helpful slides for you. There we go. We got some slides. We do it with slides here uh, just to make things really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to do it that way. That works. Okay. So, talk me through a little introduction as to why C.S. Lewis is interesting uh, for right. Mormonism. So, I was a really big C.S. Lewis fan even before the deconstruction. Um, and now, as a, in the post-Mormon space, I think he's also fascinating because this is a man who's been through two huge deconstructions himself in his life. That he was born to a pastor in Ireland um, and he was raised in like an extremely religious household and completely deconverted by the, by the time he was 20 um, and became a, an outspoken atheist. He served in World War I as an atheist. He started teaching at Oxford as an atheist um, and then went through a huge reconversion to Christianity thanks to his friends J.R.R. Tolkien and Hugo Dyson. They were all writers together. They were all at Oxford together. They were all in the same milieu. So... Uh, the, like, I think his perspectives are really interesting because he holds a lot of compassion and a lot of space for, um, for, for atheism, for people who are honest atheists, and also for people who are honest Christians. And he's very impatient with people who are superficially religious and tend to use Christianity um, to feed their own hypocrisy, to, to feed their own social status or to feed their own sense of self-righteousness. Um, but don't actually practice the, the Christianity that he sees being talked about in the Bible. So for those reasons, I think he, uh, he is a very appealing person for the lay member to read. Um, and he uh, tends to, to offer lay members a lot of um, validation for their beliefs in Mormonism because he's speaking about the general currents of Christianity in a way that's really palatable for the modern member. And the general authorities agree with this, as we'll see in um, a couple of these first slides. We'll see some of the ways that they they quote him and the ways that um, the ways that he shows up in Mormon culture. Um, but he, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> he, okay. He's he's so present in the the cultural consciousness of Mormonism that sometimes. We overlook the fact that the Christianity he describes actually doesn't match the conduct of the church mm. and really challenges the way that even lay members might practice or think about Christianity. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. But so should we, dive, dive, into should we yeah. dive right in? Excellent. So here's your first slide. Um, and I know you asked me to read the quotes on these. Are you still happy for me to do that? That would be great. Yes. Thank okay. You. Okay. 
Even Shakespeare pales in comparison to the number of times C.S. Lewis has been quoted by Mormon authors, scholars, and general authorities to illustrate or emphasize doctrinal truths. And that was Christine Richardson and Marina Thackeray, Latter-day Truths in Narnia. So he's this been is, talked about a lot. Right, yeah. So this is a scholarly work that was assembled to to um, actively, like, uh, you, you know, this isn't a blog article or things. Mm -hmm. I'll have other quotes from blogs or, or things later. These were two scholars who were really rigorously trying to uh, look at the Narnia series and other writings mm -hmm. from C.S. Lewis and see how uh, to, to basically prove that C.S. Lewis was kind of a dry Mormon, um, mm -hmm. that he was presenting a gospel that really aligned with Mormonism when he was presenting Christianity. Um, I, think I love I love how the... Mormons do this. Just before we go to the next slide, I love how Mormons take someone good in the world, someone that is, says things that they vibe with, and they go, "Right now, I've got to set out to prove that he's basically just one of us. He's he's actually yeah. just a Mormon, right? In everything but name. I've got to I've got to make sure I can prove that because I think we'll talk about it later. But this in group out group behavior that we find in the church can lead us to really need to pull people into our tribe in order for us to yes. really be able to kind of validate what they have to say. So here's the next slide. Here's your key question. Uh, is Could C.S. Lewis be considered a dry Mormon? Like, is that is that a viable hypothesis that scholars mm -hmm. like uh, oh, Christine and sorry. Marianne are mm -hmm. presenting and that lay members tend to gravitate towards too? I think that's such a good observation that this uh, feeds into the in-group, out-group thinking of church members because I think that's totally right. That because he's he's technically on the outside, but because we resonate with him so much, we mm -hmm. just have to we have to make these provisions for him to be actually on the inside. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is that justifiable though? It could C.S. Lewis really be considered a dry Mormon? Or conversely, would Lewis, if he were exposed to the church, you know, if he mm -hmm. only knew more about the church, would he consider Mormonism to be Christian? Would he resonate with Mormonism in the same way? Ellie and um, Rue saying, have... oh, they're just saying uh, that's because all truth has to come from the right tribe. Therefore, he's in our tribe. And then that sums yeah. up really nicely. Yeah, and the all truth circumscribed into one great whole, I think is, you know, it all feeds into this, these, uh, the factors that make members want to assimilate Lewis into part of their, their, um, their club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually have a quote from the one time that we have a recorded interaction with between Lewis and a C, uh, sorry, a Salt Lake woman who was writing to him during the publishing of Narnia. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear? Yeah, exactly yeah, please. what that is. It's not like super revolutionary, but I just think it's it's fun because most members have this question in their minds about like, you know, did did he ever get in contact with the church because church mm -hmm. members just love him so much? Um, so this is from a, a a blog article by Michael DeGroote. He says there is no record that Lewis had any contact with the church, but he did correspond regularly with a woman who lived in Salt Lake City. The authors write that although, oh, and although we don't have the original letter, Lewis's reply to her inquiry was as follows. I am afraid, this is Lewis speaking, I'm afraid I am not going to be much help at all about the religious bodies mentioned in your letter of March 2nd, which would be the LDS church. Um, we are, we're, we're presuming because we don't have her letter. Um, I have always in my books been concerned simply to put forward mere Christianity and am no guide on these most regrettable interdenominational questions. I do, however, strongly object to the tyrannic and unscriptural insolence of anything that calls itself a church and makes teetotalism a condition of membership. <laughs> <laughs> so like... <laughs> The one record we have of him like interacting with someone who who was trying to uh, be a member missionary is that he he called it tyrannical and mm -hmm. insolent and unscriptural <laughs> to to do anything like requiring the word of wisdom. Excellent. Okay, but that that's all. It's just a fun aside. Cool. All right. So here's the here's the context then. Uh, and when we were preparing for this, you talked to me about this um, kind of post-war rebrand of the LDS Church. I, I found it absolutely fascinating. So I want you to run us through that, please. Oh, wonderful. Because I think it's fascinating, too. And I only kind of mm. realized it in preparing for this uh, presentation. Um, but basically what you need to know is that Lewis was he was born at the very end of the of the 19th century in 1898. And he was active through like the middle of the 20th century. He died in, let's see, I think it was 1963. Mm -hmm. um, so this is that's the period when when Lewis is most active from the 30s to the 50s. Um, 
Meanwhile, the LDS church over in Utah is having a lot of troubles because everybody knows them as the weirdy polygamists with the beards. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, they're really struggling to, to make any progress with their uh, missionary work and other things because polygamy is like the only thing that they're known for. So David O. McKay has um, this 20, almost 20 year long presidency. Uh, in the church and then, you know, 20 other years before he became president. So he has like a, a very uh, strong influence on the church in this time. And what he does is rebrand the church as being clean, crisp um, Christians. Uh, he's the one who who starts to refine the missionary image. He's the one who who makes everybody go clean shaven. Uh, he is very iconic in like his white suit. He really wanted to present this version of Mormonism that was a lot cleaner, a lot more educated, a lot more intellectual, a lot more interdenominational and um, friendly with uh, neighbors mm -hmm. than the polygamous Brigham Young version of mm -hmm. Mormonism. And one of the ways that he did this, and he was assisted majorly in this effort by Neil A. Maxwell, which is why his picture's up here. Uh, the, one of the ways that he conducted this rebrand on the intellectual side of Mormonism um, in, in freshening up like how, how Mormons were perceived as uh, like not completely insular. We were willing to quote from outside sources. We were, mm -hmm. we were wanting to be called Christians, et cetera. Um, one of the ways that he did that was to start quoting from non-Mormon authors. And Neil A. Maxwell especially loved C.S. Lewis. That he, what, let me see if I can find this. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to read a quote from someone's master's thesis. I can give you the mm -hmm. citation after this. But he, uh, Neil A. Maxwell, published a book called A More Excellent Way, in 1967, in which he included more quotes from C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, G.K. Chesterton, Abraham Maslow, and John Gardner than it did from Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. And that was the first time this had happened in, um, in, in Mormon history, that usually the prophets were prioritized above every other voice. And so to have um, a, a, a very senior church leader like Apostle Neil A. Maxwell uh, quoting heavily from all of these non-Mormon authors um, was very significant. Mm -hmm. Neil A. Maxwell also conducted a series of lectures called, um, let's see, what were they called? Uh, called Time Vindicates the Prophets. This was in uh, 1954. Um, and the Time Vindicates the Prophets were basically the Mormonized version of C.S. Lewis's talks, Mere Christianity, which had been given 10 years earlier. Oh, um, right. And so what we'll see like in, in kind of like Mormon and Lewis history is that Lewis is like doing all of these things in the UK um, mm -hmm. for Christianity. And then like about 10 to 12 years after he does those things, the, the mainstream church picks up on them and kind of uses them to, to accelerate their rebrand, to, mm. to substantiate their rebrand, to try and um, communicate like just how Christian they are. But we're better than Christians because like, <laughs> it's about prophets. And, and that's kind of like the, the interesting tension that we have now in the modern church between like, we're super Christian. We're just like everybody else. We're, we're all just trying to be like Christ, but everybody else is just playing church. Like that kind of <laughs> yes. really happened um, or started to happen in like this period of David O. McKay and Neil A. Maxwell as they were rebranding the church because they introduced a strong strain of, of mere Christianity that largely came from Lewis. And that has developed over the years into this, this hybrid beast that we have now mm -hmm. where like members think of themselves as Christians. They call themselves Christians. They have the church of Jesus Christ.org, but they also believe in some pretty fundamentally unchristian things and mm -hmm. they act in pretty fundamentally un Christian ways. Um, so it's where that dichotomy has yeah. as slipped into Mormonism. It's here because mm -hmm. in trying to reach out to the world and, and make ourselves appear Christian um, and and to emphasize the Christian parts of our faith, uh, they've used Lewis as a vehicle for yes. that. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. And as we'll see later, like sometimes it was um, ethically done in that they were citing him uh, mm -hmm. like Neil A. Maxwell um, and, and just like using only the quotes that agreed with with Mormonism. And other times it was less ethically done and like not really cited as mm. much. So <laughs> it's, well, a, it's a complicated relationship. Okay, so here you're, you're, you're pointing out how modern members uh, or Mormons see C.S. Lewis. Take it away. Uh -huh. So these are, um, this is just a sampling of some of the ways that C.S. Lewis is showing up in modern um, mm -hmm. LDS culture. Uh, there is a, a BYU C.S. Lewis Society. I I don't remember if I was a member, but I definitely wanted to be a member. Mm -hmm. I took the BYU C.S. Lewis class. Um, I wrote a lot about him. I quoted him in both of my theses that I did through BYU. Um, he, he's also in Education Week pretty frequently, mm -hmm. as you can see from the, the schedule down there, which is hosted, of course, at BYU alongside mm -hmm. prophets and apostles and stuff. Um, and then a lot of bloggers also pick him up. They, there's regularly these lists of like the top 100 C.S. Lewis quotes, top mm -hmm. 50 C.S. Lewis quotes, top 30 C.S. Lewis quotes that show that the gospel is true. Um, so like they like members love C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. and it's totally understandable why he's very he's very amicable and very approachable and he makes Christianity seem really awesome. So yeah. um, I really love this quote here from the Mormon Soprano blog where they yeah, say, please. In a very real way, C.S. Lewis is a poster child for Mormon intellectualism. At times, he expresses biblical concepts key to LDS doctrine that many Christians often overlook. Um, he may as well be Elder C.S. Lewis as well, is what Third Hour Blog says. And I find that really interesting that why aren't we going to our own people for this? Yes. Why, why are we outsourcing <laughs> Mormon intellectualism uh -huh. to C.S. Lewis? And again, that all comes back to why we have to almost try to see him as a dry Mormon, because it... it it, otherwise, he undermines that idea that we've got everything we need. It's like, well, hang on, we're having to go to this guy to to really put in biblical terms some of the stuff that a lot of other Christians call us unchristian for. He seems to fix that gap, but why yes. is he doing it as an outsider? Yes. Oh, I think that's such a good question. It's one of the ones that really triggered my faith crisis too. Was this this uh, realization that like that you can feel so much of the spirit from places that aren't the church mm -hmm. and that you could go to the general conference and feel like actually a departure of the spirit. That was very weird to me. And mm -hmm. I, I, we didn't do this very much for this presentation, but um, what you said just sparked this, um, this thought for me that <laughs> I, I would guess that CS Lewis's words in Mormonism have actually had longer staying power than any single apostle or prophet, Ooh. because we're now disavowing, things that were said even 20 years ago, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, and we're still quoting C.S. Lewis as, mm -hmm. a, as though he's right. So I grew up knowing that C.S. Lewis, this guy C.S. Lewis, before I'd even read any of his stuff, that he was considered the 13th apostle. When I was what? on my mission, we talked about him as like, oh yeah, C.S. Lewis should have been baptized. Like he, <laughs> he totally got the gospel. He just didn't know the truth. Um, right. and, and that kind of thing has been around for a long time. Like since the fifties and sixties, people were responding to C.S. Lewis in this way. And now as the church is trying to distance itself from even Spencer W. Kimball, um, mm -hmm. Ezra Taft Benson, um, <laughs> even Hinckley, like we're mm -hmm. trying to distance ourselves from all of these previous process prophets, but, um, but Lewis has stayed. So he's kind of more of a, of a prophet than anyone mm. that we would call a prophet in the uh, yeah ideas. totally yeah he's he's not been disavowed yet although after yeah. this video we shall see okay <laughs> so we come to a first kind of topic then so i i am i right in thinking that what we're going to move into now is essentially looking at some concepts some ideas some topics that cs lewis had things to say about and that we're going to look at the lds view or position on these topics and then have a look at what cs lewis had to say about them is that about right yes sir um i have two um so this is this is context for for you to um gauge our time if we don't feel like we mm -hmm. have time to go through all of the slides i just have two for um comparing lds and two for comparing um lewis for each mm -hmm. topic uh so we can we can contract it as necessary okay that way that's fine okay did you, you want to read the quotes on this yeah, yeah i wanted sure. to give like an an honest uh, representation of everything that the the church says about mm -hmm. wealth and charity and not just pick out the ones that um 
that make them look bad. So <laughs> see, Laura's better so, than me because I would have just totally picked the ones that make them look bad. So well done, Laura. Thank I think you. you would do that too. It's I mean that's a good rhetorical approach is that mm-hmm. you steal yeah. man the other person's yes. argument. So I want to so. acknowledge that like there are good things being said mm-hmm. in uh in the context of LDS Mormonism, yeah. and that their actions don't necessarily measure up to what they say, mm-hmm. but that they are saying a lot of good things. So. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Looks good. Let's steel man the LDS church before we let C.S. Lewis take a hammer to them. <laughs> right. Being wealthy is not morally wrong. The danger, as the Book of Mormon repeatedly emphasizes, is that when people become wealthy, they sometimes forget the Lord and his commandments. We must remember why the Lord might bless us with wealth and understand both why and when we should seek it. Jacob explained, After ye have t- obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches prosperity gospel if ye seek them and ye will seek them for the intent to do good to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to liberate the captive and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted so that's leona april 2002 laura has added the emphasis herself yeah i added emphasis to the Mm. things that i think um show the biggest contrast because Mm. the lds church says this they acknowledge that the important work of christianity is clothing the naked feeding Mm. the hungry liberating the captive and administering relief to the sick and afflicted and i think it's uh pretty problematic the way that that doesn't happen Mm -hmm. and then we have this quote from come follow me about why we pay tithing paying tithing is a sacred privilege When we pay tithing, we show gratitude for all that God has given us and return to him a portion of what we have received. Tithing is used to build temples and meeting houses, translate and publish the scriptures and do missionary and family history work and in other ways build God's kingdom on earth. I've got to say here real quick, I've just done a video um, with uh, Julian Heath from Sunstone. He's starting up a little series, so um, I'll get you details of that when we have it. But we've just done the first video as as a trial um to see how it goes and we were talking about this trendy tithing article that came out recently i don't know if you saw that laura yes Um, i did yeah which you know calls me out so that's great you know i've made it uh i've been talked about in in this but what they say is they repeatedly gone about how it's selfish it's selfish to not pay tithing and instead give your money to charity and there's a couple of things wrong with that one how i I think they also called it logical that tithing yes. is logical and it's illogical yeah. to give it somewhere else. And I was just like... Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you're characterizing giving money to charity as selfish, I'm, I'm not sure how you would do that. But also, what they, they aren't telling the reader is that LDS tithing only pays for the upkeep of LDS meeting houses, for the works of the church in terms of sending missionaries to and from the mission field. It pays for the building and upkeep of temples. It pays for all those sorts of things. It pays to put the lights on in the buildings. It doesn't do charity work. It doesn't help to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to liberate the captive and minister relief to the sick and afflicted. Tithing doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. So the idea that paying tithing but not giving money to charity is selfish, well, actually, paying tithing serves your own self-interest because it helps the church run. So... I just wanted to get that in there. Sorry. (laughs) No, I have a quote about that in the next Uh slide too. So, so we can, um, we can keep. And they do have it here that tithing (laughs) may be used for constructing and maintaining temples, churches, and other church owned buildings, operating church Mm -hmm. education programs, printing scriptures and other materials, doing family history research. Um, you know, when the church publishes its charity commission's report, when they say, you know, this is what we spent our money on, you should see some of the things they list as charity we're giving. Some of the Osmonds um, did the music for a meeting with delegate with delegates and councilmen and sorts of stuff in London, and that was charity work apparently. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Ugh. So yeah, and the more are. the more I go on, the more I find out stuff like that, like that you know the helping hands, uh, mm-hmm. uh, like promotional program like all of those hours from people they tally them up and then count them as as uh like the charitable donations that they're giving because their time is worth something it's it's really weird i don't know how to understand all of that because the finances aren't open and so a Mm -hmm. lot of what we hear is is either speculation or hearsay Mm -hmm. Uh, but what we do know is not encouraging and it doesn't Mm -hmm. uh, inspire a lot of confidence that it's going well behind the scenes (laughs) And here in the UK, we can see some of their charity commissions filings. So if you live in a country that has financial transparency in that sense, I would encourage you to reach out and let me know what you can find um, about what the church has to file in terms of information, because it would help us put together a a global image of exactly what's going on. Laura, tell me about this slide, please. 
Oh, well, I just love this picture. I think it's so appropriate. <laughs> we should have this in every temple. <laughs> uh, but this is about the, uh, the enzyme yeah. peak problems, mm -hmm. of course. And then it's also a headline from ProPublica about the, the problematic situation of aid welfare mm -hmm. in Utah specifically, because you would think that with as much wealth as the church has, that maybe they can't solve all of the world's problems, but they could at least solve Utah's problems. Mm -hmm. They could maybe even solve the Mountain West's problems. Uh, but, you know, the closer you get to the epicenter, actually, the more problematic it gets. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, do you mind reading the quote? Yeah, again? so I'm going to read I'm going to read the um, welfare state one. I've done enzyme peak to death. I've done videos on it. It's a well okay, established we can, fact. We can just uh, skim it if you want. We'll move past that. The church got $100 billion. They've got enough money to end malaria in right. the blink of an eye, right? They could just distribute everything you would need to stop malaria in its tracks. All sorts right. of and it's also, it represents a total misreading of the parable mm -hmm. of talents. It does. Like every time they trot out the, t the parable mm -hmm. of talents, it, it just seems... Yeah, I've done a video, go ridiculous. check it out, where um, essentially the presiding bishopric sit down and try and justify the presence of the Enzyme Peak Fund without directly addressing it. They say, you know, we need money to do this, we need money to do that. Mm -hmm. At every instance, it's not a good excuse, it's not a good reason for them to have this level of wealth. But let's look at the welfare problems in Utah. So this says, Utah makes welfare so hard to get, some feel they must join the LDS Church to get aid. Utah's safety net for the poor is so intertwined with the LDS Church that individual bishops often decide who receives assistance. Some deny help unless a person goes to services or gets baptized, which is just wrong. It is so wrong. Do you have any personal experience with that, Laura, or do you know much more about that? I don't, I don't know a lot about it personally. I've heard a lot of anecdotal stories mm -hmm. from people in, in Facebook groups and things about how, uh, like one that, that stands out in my memory was a returned missionary who was asked to be a translator mm -hmm. for one of the visiting authorities. It wasn't one of the Q15, but it was one of the like area authorities um, who came to their ward and he made it his job to like thin out the welfare lists of, of the ward. Um, I want to say it was in South America, but that might be stretching my memory. So, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, he had to translate and he felt so honored to translate uh, for, for this authority as he was there. But as he was telling person after person that they were now not going to receive any help from the church, he was watching, you know, widowed members just break down in tears and be mm -hmm. like, I have no way to afford rent. I can't feed my kids. I can't do anything. And they, and then they would just give some, some like reheated line about how if they keep paying their tithing that they'll make it. And mm. I, I think that is like, those stories are pretty impactful uh, because once you've, if you only hear one of them, you think like, oh, well, that could have been an exaggeration. That could have just been a one-time thing. Could have just been a bad egg. Could have just been that bishop. You can make a lot of apologetics for those, but after you start seeing it on like the ex-Mormon Reddit and the Facebook groups and the people expressing so much remorse over the part that they played in denying other people welfare, um, when there are you know people in Utah County who are having their cable bills paid by the mm -hmm. church because they they like they get laid off a little earlier than they thought they would and they're living mm -hmm. in these gorgeous homes and the church is paying their power bill like why yeah. why is that happening why are we not <laughs> doing you know the work that that they even outline in the previous slide feeding the mm -hmm. the hungry clothing the naked all of these things I think it all comes um, back to this in group and out group behavior be out. it all comes back to the in group and out group stuff is that, oh, well, these people are the out-group. So we look after our in-group first and then the out-group. This has been put in the comments really interesting. Sunflower Seed says, uh, for over a decade, our stake's annual Helping Hands project was plant bushes for the city. I learned we only did it in exchange for using the big park for our yearly pioneer picnic. Never helped again. Wow. Wow, that doesn't sound good. That, but equally doesn't sound unfeasible. So thank you for sharing that. Let's let's have a look at what... what Lewis would say about charity then, shall we? Yeah. Okay. So one of the reasons that Lewis really appeals to um, a lot of a lot of people, not just in the church, but elsewhere, is that he took his, what he said so seriously. Mm -hmm. And that when he talks about charity, we're talking about someone who was observed at the end of his life, giving away up to 60% of his paycheck to mm -hmm. the charitable areas, to to other charities. And this is after, you know, like, 
the the UK tax situation I'm not super familiar with. I just know mm -hmm. it's higher than America. So mm -hmm. like it seems like if if uh if an Oxford Don can give that much to charity and speak about it so clearly, certainly the cushion that we have in the LDS church should be enough to be providing mm -hmm. some of that same benefit. Absolutely. To Let's our have a look what he right? what he said. Yeah. Go he for said it. For many of us, the great obstacle to charity lies not in our luxurious living or desire for more money, but in our fear, fear of insecurity. He also said, oh, go on, please. Oh, I was just going to say that's really writ large for the church because every mm -hmm. time they are called upon to justify as much wealth as they do have hoarded up, they talk about like, oh, well, we just have to save it for a rainy day. We just have to mm -hmm. make sure the church is taken care of. We have to take care of the church's assets. Like all of that is rooted in fear and insecurity. And it totally contradicts um, the Christian principles of like, mm -hmm. you know, take neither person or script. Uh, don't worry about the future. It's sufficient unto the day, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure the servant that buried his talent in the ground got told off for it right yeah um, exactly equally, he wasn't told to go make it make money on the american stock market but you know mm -hmm. there's a middle ground there um right. he says in voyage of the dawn treader sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart he had become a dragon himself is, so is he talking about the... russell nelson there or <laughs> it would apply right yeah mm -hmm. i think so um so i actually included this because i saw this amazing meme um recently that talked about the horde of smaug uh mm -hmm. from J.R.R. tolkien's the hobbit mm -hmm. um and of course lewis and, and tolkien were friends right so they're all in my my headspace together uh so smog was recently assessed by a modern financier uh mm -hmm. and it was estimated that smog's wealth being buried in gold in this huge cavern of gold was about 51.4 billion dollars <laughs> And the fact that like what mm. what we know about from the church's assets, like at least mm. doubles, maybe triples, possibly quadruples that number is is like I felt like this quote was just <laughs> yeah, so perfect. descriptive of the of the church right now. Perfect. And if we were looking at Tolkien and Mormonism, I'm sure we could have pulled up all sorts of stuff about dragon sickness and, you know, the issues of, of coveting gold. Um but honestly, the, I, it's not lost on me that Erebor, the home of the dwarves, is cut out of a mountain. Mm. And uh, our church also likes to cut vaults out of mountains and hide stuff away. So it's the, the, the irony is not lost there. Um, yeah. he, he also says in the Screwtape Letters, which, you know, that oft misquoted book, uh, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding its place in him. His increasing reputation his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing an agreeable work, build up, uh, build up in him a sense of being really at home in earth, which is just what hell wants. Yep, I, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of these things are self-explanatory if you know enough about um, mm -hmm. the like what we what we're aware of in the church finances and i know you've done other videos on those so is there would you provide any further commentary on this or about the church finances not really just um the church sucks when it comes to financial transparency and using the money to to help those in need and uh, the other thing is that recently they've just made a change to the donation slips mm -hmm. um they've now just got rid of all the different categories right so it's just uh tithing uh other general or general donation or other and then uh local if you want it to stay local basically because i guess they can't mismanage your money if they just don't tell you where it's going to go right and the Suppose. tithing slips have already had for a long time that phrase that says mm -hmm. like you you don't get to know where this goes the church it says although every effort it it's essentially although every effort has been taken to remove nuts some may still remain it's that same thing although every effort may uh, it has been taken to use your money the way that you asked to. Ultimately, the money becomes the property of the church and we can do with it what we want, is what it says, essentially. It's just right. a bit of disclaimer. And I think that the um, the actions of the church when um, it comes to money also kind of show where their heart is. You know, the treasure is where, where their heart is. And right now it's mostly in Florida with mm -hmm. some outposts in Hawaii uh, and a little bit of their heart is in Washington ranch land. And then they have um, quite a bit of, of Utah, of course. 
Uh, so I think, <laughs> I think that the way C.S. Lewis says it is just very memorable that mm -hmm. like your, your money goes to what you care about. And yep. the way that the church spends money shows us that it doesn't care about the members. It doesn't care about community. It doesn't care about humanitarian aid. It cares about real estate. It mm -hmm. cares about the stock market. It cares about like wealth hoarding and providing for their own, like the top leaders own interests and their family interests. And that's pretty clear. It is pretty clear. And I think it was really important in all this and I'm sure we'll reiterate it many times is that if you like what Lewis has to say if you view if you're a member of the church watching and you view Lewis as a dry Mormon and you really resonate with his views that's fine but then that means you should give him some credit or take some you know um, give some credence to his words when he says no no charity is, is about this and this juxtaposition should be concerning to you I would think uh, let me right read these by their fruits you shall know them by mm -hmm. by their uh, book sales you shall know them which would also sales. mean that Lewis is on top. So He's doing well. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure his is done better than Heart to Heart by Russell M. Nelson. For sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm at a point in my life now where I know the name of Russell M. Nelson's autobiography. I don't like that. Okay, <laughs> if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, temples, no, he didn't say that. If our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common amongst those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charity's expenditure excludes them. Sometimes our pride also hinders our charity. We are tempted to spend more than we ought on the showy arms of generosity, tipping, hospitality, or temples, <laughs> and less than we ought on those who really need our help. Yeah. So this, um, I think, goes right to, to the heart of it because... Mm -hmm. The things that tithing is used for, even by the church's own publications, are buildings, mm -hmm. temples, operating those buildings, printing their own materials, self-promotion. That's what the money is used for. Um, and that's the like, so the money that isn't used is its own problem. But the mm -hmm. way that the money is used is another problem. Mm -hmm. uh, because what uh, the, the Christianity that Lewis is presenting, which... Um, oh, hold on. I lost my place, which is described in this quote is that like your, your showy versions of or your, your ways of showing who you are through money, mm -hmm. um, tell us what you value mm -hmm. and that if, if you value other people, the way that Christ seems to have valued other people or told others to value other people, then, then your expenditures will go towards helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, and buildings and temples only serve the small fraction, the shrinking fraction of people in the world who are members. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it seems pretty clear like how self-serving um, the, the church's financial situation is especially when compared to someone who is teaching um, a more grounded version of Christianity. Mm. That sounds uh, absolutely right. Uh, before I read this next quote, I haven't read much Lewis. That's something I should get out there. Uh, disgraceful of me, I know, uh, but I haven't read much C.S. Lewis. And so here's what I'm thinking. If you want to see this happen, go in the comments, put a comment, say, yes, I'd like it to happen. Hit the like button if you want this to happen. I reckon I should read Mere Christianity and then me and Laura should get back together again and we should review just that book and we should have a look at it. If you want to see that, let us know. I'm going to read this quote now because this is more Lewis than I've ever read in my life. We only uh, we see only the results which a man's choices make out of his raw material. But God does not judge him on the raw material at all, but on what he has done with it. Taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices... All your life, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. 
So the key question here for me is like, mm -hmm. how have our leaders today used their raw material? Because mm -hmm. a common apologetic is that like, why would you blame these leaders for all of these problems? You know, they, like they didn't start these things. They're, they're just doing their best. And I think that probably they are doing their best for their context. Um, however, I also think like they have to realize that they have more power in this system than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that if they wanted to, they could completely change how the church is, is using its raw material. And the fact that generation after generation just goes by without that raw material being used for anything except for self-promotion and self-fulfillment is very problematic um, for something that calls itself a church, for something that calls itself a Christian church. Mm -hmm. And especially for someone that's using the words of Lewis, like, like other quotes from this same book, to justify their own actions because that is not at all the type of Christianity that, that Lewis is promoting here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not at all. Not at all. Um, we have a vote here. I vote for Nemo Reads, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Jack and Ori style. Jack and Ori being an old British TV show where they read books in a kind of, now children, we're going to read this book. <laughs> that sort of thing. So um, Primary voice. Yeah. <laughs> primary voice but no 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 because it's not as creepy as a primary voice it's just a very gentle british bedtime story voice um it's not as creepy as primary voice no way okay next slide integrity integrity was something that was important to lewis it's something that is also important to the LES church according to to what is taught um so right so this whole um page is mm -hmm. from dallin h oaks's gospel teachings online uh maybe <laughs> I'll recommend to pause if you want to read all the quotes. Yeah. I roughly segregated it into two columns. So the first column is um, things that I think are really defensible. Like I think that's mm -hmm. a, a solid um, a, a solid exposition of like the important of, importance of honesty and integrity. Um, let's start with the second column though, mm -hmm. because that's where it starts to get problematic. Yeah. So down there shows you saying things like no one deplores lying, uh, lawyer lying more than I do, all that sort of stuff, that nothing good comes from lying. The obligation to tell the truth does not require one to tell everything he or she knows in all circumstances. When the truth is constrained by other obligations, the outcome is not falsehood, but silence for a reason. <laughs> cool. We must not lie, but we are free to tell less than we know when we have no duty to disclose. <laughs> Attorney-client privilege and the comparable privileges of other professionals safeguard confidential disclosures and give legal recognition to the principle that one is not a liar when one remains silent in a circumstance in which there is no duty to disclose. Mm, see, he did a real bait and switch there. We'll come back to that. Uh, and he finally says, it requires sophisticated analysis of the circumstances and a finely tuned conscience to distinguish between the situation where you are obliged by duty to speak and the situation where you are obliged by duty, commandment or covenant to remain silent. So, right, I'm just not as sophisticated or finely tuned in conscience as him, clearly. Right, that, like if you yeah. had a more sophisticated conscience, mm -hmm. you'd be able to ju justify all justify of the lies this. that... <laughs> yeah, well, because here, right, he starts by saying something very good. Attorney-client privilege and the comparable privileges of other professionals safeguard confidential disclosures and give legal recognition. Ah, right, they stop there. They safeguard mm -hmm. confidential disclosures. They do that. So when I'm in clinic seeing patients, what patients tell me is safeguarded by law, right? Mm -hmm. Good, that is a good thing. But then he says that that gives legal recognition to the principle that one is not a liar when one remains silent in a circumstance in which there is no duty to disclose. He's he's making it a positive action, like it is your duty to disclose. No, what is happening there is that you have a duty not to disclose certain information because of your legal binding. It's not that so he he's he's changing the wording to make it sound like see when you don't have to tell someone you don't need to and you're not a liar. It's it's not that. It's when you can't tell someone because legally you're not allowed, that's when you're not a liar. And it's very well known that you do know something, you can't say it for legal reasons. And that's there's no shadiness about that. 
Right. Yeah. And I think um, to to steel man this argument, this talk was given to the BYU Law School. And so I think that could be one of the reasons that attorney client privilege is coming up. Mm -hmm. Maybe he meant to cater this um, in, a, in a way to say that, like, you know what, if you're in the courtroom and you feel like you um, like you're dishonest because you're not um, telling everything you know about this situation in the courtroom, that that's still okay. You don't have to feel guilty about that. So I want to leave that as a possibility that that could be like the best case scenario for this talk. However, given the history of Dallin H. Oaks, as we know from his public addresses and specifically things like where he denied that electroshock therapy happened at BYU when it clearly did, it has his mm -hmm. signature on it at oh, BYU yeah. while he was president. Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Once we put it into context of Dallin H. Oaks's actual history um, with, with talking to the members, I think that puts these quotes into a pretty different light. And it shows us something significant about the way that he sees his role as an apostle. That usually when we are presented with this idea that we have, we have 12 apostles, they're all prophets, seers, and revelators. Mm -hmm. We as members are supposed to be under the impression that they are spiritual and moral um, uh, like leaders for us, that, that yeah. we can set them up as models. We can put their pictures in our home and tell our mm -hmm. kids to look up to them. It's uh, those kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. How he sees his role as an apostle, though, is as a lawyer, because what he's justifying is that if if you don't have to tell bad things about something like church history, mm -hmm. then you don't have to. You know, they didn't ask about it. That's uh, that's on them. And in his face to faces, wasn't it with Ballard um, mm -hmm. that they kind of explicitly said, like, we're not going to answer questions that we that we don't have answers to. Yes. And they got some really explicit quotes of how they were sidestepping these issues because they didn't feel like the members deserve to know. Like. <laughs> I don't know. It's it crazy. becomes very problematic once you put it in context. It does. So we've got some here from Boyd K. Packer as well on integrity. Uh, which of these do you want me to read? Let's see. I think I think we can read both of these. Sweet. Okay. I'll, I'll churn through these. So there are plenty of scholars in the world determined to find all secular truth. There are so few of us, relatively speaking, striving to convey the spiritual truths who are protecting the church. We cannot safely be neutral. Some things are to be taught selectively, and some things are to be given only to those who are worthy. It matters very much, not only what we are told, but when we are told it. Be careful that you build faith rather than destroy it. President William E. Barrett has told us how grateful he is that a testimony... Uh, a, yeah, how grateful he is that a testimony that the past leaders of the church were prophets of God was firmly fixed in his mind before he was exposed to some of the so-called facts that historians have put in their published writings. Oh, can we? Uh, I'm not sure we have time to unpack that, but <laughs> that's. Oh, so I'm so grateful that he was determined to come to one conclusion before I presented him with the contrary evidence. Cool. Right. Yeah. This this whole talk is a pretty great example of the in speak versus the out speak because mm. he's giving this talk. Quid Packer is giving this talk in 1981 to CES educators. I think at BYU, but it could have been in an institute around around the same area. But he's telling them like, don't tell your students stuff that might challenge their testimony, mm. even if it's true. Not everything that that's true is useful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and this is a uh, like one of the things he's most famous for because this talk became required reading for CES educators for mm -hmm. at least the twenty to thirty years after that. When we read it two years ago, it was still being required um, mm -hmm. as, as for CES educators. I don't know if it is anymore, but just because it's given in 1981 doesn't mean that this is outdated counsel for CES educators. That he gave this as kind of a benchmark speech to say that. Like, this is the position we as church mm -hmm. ed educators are taking that we're n going to be selective about well, he the says things here, that we tell students. He says, in the church, we are not neutral. We are one-sided. There is a mm -hmm. war going on and we are engaged in it. Um, something about musket fire. Uh, it is the war between good and evil and we are belligerents defending the good. 
We are therefore obliged to give preference to and protect all that is represented in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have made covenants to do it. So he's um, kind of inciting temple covenants there and, you know, therefore death penalties. Uh, those who have carefully posed their work of any relig religious faith in the name of academic freedom or so-called honesty ought not to be expected to be accommodated in their researches or to be paid by the church to do it. Wow. Okay. <gasps> Yeah, there's like I, not enough time to go through this. Yeah, whole I feel like time. I should have it's to so move on from that. Um, okay, so we got here examples of top leaders. So is this um, examples of lies by top leaders? Yeah, these are just some Excellent. of the ones that immediately came to mind. I think I've mentioned yeah. a lot of them already, uh, mm -hmm. like the electroshock therapy thing from Oaks or mm -hmm. um, Holland saying that not what one red cent was spent on. Yeah. Uh, and I've done videos on made. all of these apart from Bednar. Um, all of these are yes, and the Bednar one was done. just recently. So Bednar's video is next. He is the next apostle that's going to be brought to bear. So um, watch this space. No, sorry, sorry, I can't compare. Sister, uh, Sister Bednar's husband uh, is going to have a video done about him next, um, and uh, we look forward to exploring the lies that of Susan has told. Um, so yeah, there's all these examples. Oh, no of need them, to drag her name lying. through the mud. This isn't no, her fault. <laughs> no, it's not her fault. But equally, you know, I've got to give her some power back. Yeah. So what would Lewis say about integrity? Integrity All is right. doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. Well, that's different, isn't it? And I'm sure like this is a quote that really stands out because I'm pretty sure I heard this quote at least a dozen times before I ever read Mere Christianity. Ooh, yeah. I think that's pretty well circulated within mm -hmm. the Mormon context too. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Can go to the other one. Yeah. He also said the most dangerous thing you can do is to take any uh to take any one impulse of your own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. There is not one of them which will not make us into devils if we set it up as an absolute guide. You might think the love of humanity in general was safe, but it is not. If you leave out justice you will find yourself breaking agreements and faking evidence in trials for the sake of humanity. You've put here all the good name of the church. Oh, and sorry, become. Did I, leave there? <laughs> I was supposed to be a star in a room. <laughs> yeah, uh, I added and... the the no, no, no. You've that. put it in a little star. Yeah, you added that in. Um, oh, okay. And become the end of a cruel, treacherous man. He did that from the abolition of man that was taken. Uh, justice means much more than the sort of thing that goes on in law courts. It is the old name for everything we should now call fairness. It includes honesty, give and take, truthfulness, keeping promises, and all that side of life. This reminds me of a quote that I heard. It might be Lewis, actually, but I, I don't know where I heard it. But any virtue taken to excess can become a vice. It's that same thing. Any, mm -hmm. uh, any one impulse, any part of human nature... If you take it up, if you set it up above all other things to the exclusion of others, it can become dangerous and problematic. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, I don't know if that's specifically Lewis, but it does sound it's very much in his, his style, right? I chose these two quotes because they specifically target things of a legal nature. And both Boyd K. Packer in The Mantle is far, far greater than the precept. And, um, or sorry, yeah. Than the intellect. Yeah than the intellect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Dallin H. Oaks is uh, the gospel teachings online. Uh, both of them frame their role as church leaders in terms of, of like lawyerliness <laughs> as lawyers for the church. Like they, they're not leaders for the members. They're not representing the members to God. They're representing, you know, their, their ideas of God to the, the members. And so they see the members almost as, uh, uh, as like the opposing side of a legal case, mm -hmm. not as their sheep in a flock. Yes. They're not taking care of them. They're trying to manipulate them. That's trying to manage them. Like what a, a battle between lawyers is about. You're trying to, like, uh, you know, manipulate the, the evidence so that it appears in a certain way that is favorable to your client. Mm -hmm. And that is what they're doing with the history and the doctrine of the church is that they're trying to spin it in a way that it convinces members to do what they say. Yeah. Um, and I think what Lewis does really well is cut to the heart of it and say like, is stop, stop the, the nonsense about this being a court case. Like mm. you set up the good name of the church or the, or, or the good, um, the well-being of the church or the financial prosperity of the church or any of a number of things as your ultimate good, you will become a devil because you will sacrifice mm -hmm. people to that idea. Um, it's only in making other people our priority, 
that we um, that we become more human in mm -hmm. in that way. And I think that there's a really great example that just showed up this weekend from Idaho, where a whole uh, van full of 31 people with um, with guns, rifles, other things were headed towards a pride rally in the in the middle of Idaho. And I think that the the family proclamation is one of the things the church is struggling with right now in this mm -hmm. way, that they've set the family proclamation up as something that they should follow at all costs. Yeah. And it's creating very vicious cycles within families, within friend groups, within communities um, that are not at all Christ-like, that are not at all reflective of the Christianity that Lewis or others like him have attempted to teach. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I think there's, there's a huge problem there. And Dan Lechuk is actually one of the perpetrators of that because every time he talks about the family proclamation, he's trying to make it doctrine. He's trying to really uh, put it up on a pedestal. And it's not yeah. It's not good. It's not helpful to the church at all, really, because it's one of the most divisive things at the moment. Uh, yes. And, we, you know, a, a friend uh, put in a comment when we were talking about the stake being closed here in the UK and he said he felt like he was being managed. So to your point about the church cheating it, treating its members like the opposition in a court case, it is like that. We have people saying that that's how they feel. They feel like they're being managed. They feel like they're being controlled or, or that they're trying to make things appear a certain way. They were always right. trying being to put a spin on it. Being handled is what yeah, we were saying. Being handled. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Lewis is cracking out some absolutely brilliant quotes. I'm loving these. So he says... The great thing for devils to do is to make humans humans value an opinion for some quality other than truth, thus introducing an element of dishonesty and make-believe into the heart of what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. God's whole effort will be to get the, mind, the man's mind off the subject of his own value altogether. He would rather the man thought of himself a great architect or a great poet than forget about it, and then forget about it than that he should spend much time and pains trying to think himself a bad one. Your efforts to instill either vainglory or false modesty into the patient will therefore be met from God's side with the obvious reminder that a man is not usually called upon to have an opinion of his own talents at all, since he can very well go on improving them to the best visibility without deciding on his own precise niche in the temple of fame. So wow. good! <laughs> I mean, okay, I butchered so it, but so good. <laughs> No, he did great. That was great. He has like he has his own very particular cadence, and it, it takes a little bit to to click into it. So that's why I had you read the quotes, and that me. Ah! So um, I think this is a this is so clear when it uh -huh. comes to seeing the the general authorities present themselves, because like Elder Bednar in the recent like national press thing, or in the coverage that you and others did of the, the um, rescue fire side that Elder Holland and others did at your stake. They go on and on about their own accomplishments. I was president of, of this college and I, I have this, this huge wealth of experience in this other, uh, other area, but I'm just such a, a horrible person. So they kind of like hit the vainglory and the false modesty mm -hmm. at the same time. Like... <laughs> Well, what was That's it? He I... said he looked into his family history and found his ancestors hanging by their necks. So, you know, my ancestry isn't as good as these other guys who I'm with. I'll defer to their great ancestry. And then he goes on uh, and starts saying how, you know, well, like their their election is made sure. So they can like they can suck up to each other. They just can't say nice things about themselves. So there's just this big I don't want to use the phrase that came to mind, but there's this big kind of mutual adoration, shall we say, going on. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and this, uh, this feeds back into what he says here at the beginning about valuing an opinion for some quality other than truth. Mm -hmm. There's that really famous quote in um, kind of Mormon culture where, oh, maybe you can help me out. It's, it's like this, this young bishop talking to a general authority, they're driving mm -hmm. somewhere and the general authority says like, well, just obey whatever the brethren say. And even if it's wrong, you'll be blessed for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are taught, we're actively taught um, and actively modeled with like exclamation points and question marks, we're actively told to value the opinions of these Q15 or even other area authority members for qualities other than whether what they say is true. Um, mm -hmm. And that presents this huge problem for, for all of us as members because we've started to pursue something for how it looks 
for the mm. position that they have, for the authority that they supposedly have, mm. instead of like how it is going to make us better as people. Um, that's a that's a big big problem. I, I yeah, think right huge now. problem, huge problem. And Joseph Smith warned of it in Doctrine and Covenants. He talked about the uh, vain ambitions, and you know, he talked about unrighteous dominion, how it comes about. He talks about sure. people Joseph seeking Smith to wasn't maintain influence. Exactly a paragon of it either. But. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. Um, you know, but that's not to say that what he had to say about it to try and get others to behave wasn't at least had some valid- validity. You know. Um, anyway, the next quote: "It is not that they are bad men; they are not men at all. Stepping outside the towel, they are. They have stepped into the void." Nor are their subjects necessarily unhappy men. They are not men at all. They are artifacts. Man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man. Those who stand outside all judgments of value cannot have any ground for preferring one of their own impulses to another except the emotional strength of that impulse. Okay, I'm going to pause you there before you read the other one because this one requires a little bit of context. The abolition of man is one of the most uh, interesting and philosophically sophisticated of of Lewis's works. That doesn't mean that everything he said was right in there, but it's a really interesting philosophical treatise Mm -hmm. on the fact that he sees this trend in materialism to controlling more and more of nature and to questioning more and more of the, of traditional values and so he he attempts to draw out that logic in the abolition of man mm. and say that if if you keep seeing everything as manipulatable as mm-hmm. like open to um to changing under human hands then what you end up with is a system in which the the, the ultimate humans, the humans who are in charge of everything else, in charge of manipulating everything else, including what others see as good and bad. If you have a system like that, then the people at the top become merely animals because they're not guided by an an overarching set of values or principles anymore Mm -hmm. that everyone is commonly agreed upon. They are only subject to their own impulses or their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of, it's, I I hope that's understandable. It is kind of complicated. Um, But what what I see in this quote is that we actually have quotes from general authorities who, as they're telling each other, I want to say it was Henry B. Eyring saying that this is what he was told when he became an apostle and he was trying to figure out like how to discriminate between his own thoughts and the the things that the spirit was telling him or that God was telling him. And the apostle who, who was mentoring him said, everything that comes into your head is God's thoughts. Like now you're an apostle. So whatever you feel like needs to be said, that is God's thoughts. And I feel like the abolition of man is, is like coming through on, on a lot of levels for the general authorities because they see themselves as outside of this system of integrity and virtue and, and courage and other things. They see themselves as lawyers. They see themselves as manipulating the situation yeah. so that everybody else gets to, to have exaltation too. Um, and so they are, they are the, the people in this paradigm who have reached the point where they can decide what the common people value, what yeah. right and wrong is. If it's something that the general authorities say, then it's good because it it came from God. Um, it's it's a really interesting treatise. And if you want to know more about that, it's kind of its own topic. So you should read The Abolition of Man and the Paralandra series. But we can move on to the, the Maybe next Maybe another now. book review if people go into <laughs> the comments. and ongoing book club. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Laura, I'm up for a book, book club. This This would be great. We'll just let's just do so a book fun. club. Let's just do a book club. Okay, so um, the final quote before we move on, because I think we should move to the next topic. He says, I'm very doubtful whether history shows us one example of a man who, having stepped outside traditional morality and attained power, has used that power benevolently. I'm inclined to think that the conditioners will hate the conditioned, though regarding as an illusion the artifact Uh, the artificial conscience which they produce in their subjects they will yet perceive that it creates in us an illusion of meaning for our lives which compares favorably with the futility of their own and they will envy us as eunuchs envy men it's a pretty strong stuff we'll just leave that there leave that hanging hanging. (laughs) okay this is the final kind of big topic right before we then move on to to a little bit of the other stuff so This one says, uh, in 1982, two years before being called as a general authority, Brother Russell M. Nelson said, 
I never ask myself, when does the prophet speak as a prophet and when does he not? My interest has been, how can I be more like him? And he added, my philosophy is to stop putting question marks behind the prophet's statements and put exclamation points instead. Wow. Okay, so this is the chief prophet butt kisser, as I like to re refer to the person who talks about President Nelson the most. Um, it's an affectionate term, really. But Neil L. Anderson likes to suck up to Russell M. Nelson. He just does. He, he likes to quote him a lot, uh, copiously. And he quotes here, Russell M. Nelson speaks of himself, essentially, because he then goes on to become the prophet. He thinks, oh, I don't think, when is the prophet speaking as a man? I just think, how can I be like him? Knowing that if he doesn't die and outlives everyone, people will then act like that about him. Right, he'll be doing the maths on his way. He'll be working out, oh, I have a good chance of becoming the prophet here. And so then when his wife comes along and then regurgitates his own words and says, right, question marks and exclamation marks. She actually got that idea from her husband. That's the weird thing. Yes. And that's why I chose this quote to yeah. show how long this has been circulating because mm -hmm. uh, Russell M. Nelson, you know, introduced it in 1982, which was, by the way, the year after the mantle talk from Boyd K. Packer. Mm -hmm. So this is like, this is a continuous stream of this attitude that has been like imprinted on the church. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's quoting a talk from 1982 by Russell and Nelson in mm -hmm. 2018. And then in 20, was it 2021 or 20? 2022. Was it this year or last year? Mm, this year, February. Anyway, this year. within the last year, then mm -hmm. Wendy's quoting it too. So this idea of like, stop putting question marks behind what the prophet says and put exclamation points instead. This mm -hmm. is not an outdated idea. This is one that is being continually reinforced for the past 30 years. No, mm -hmm. 40 years, 40, 40 years, years at least. <laughs> yeah, um, and was, then it, as we'll see exactly in the other column. Years. Yes, yes, exactly 40 years. Um, and as we'll see in the other column, a lot of um, these quotes are kind of um, variations on this idea mm -hmm. that like, just stop thinking so much and just trust <laughs> what the brethren say. Exactly. Right, I mean, Kerry Milstein's quote here is one that right near the beginning of my exploration into all of this really uh, aggrieved me. <laughs> and it still does. Mm -hmm. I yeah. start out, this is from a man, by the way, an academic who specializes in um, ancient Egypt, right? He is the church's, one of the church's go-to men for academia right. regarding ancient Egyptian stuff. So the book of Abraham. I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and anything else that we get from the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try to fit into that paradigm. So the that is just <laughs> loves blank checks. If yes. you, like that's all it really wants is a blank check on your obedience and a blank uh -huh. check on your bank account. Like just more the blank checks the better. Yeah. So so he he basically likes to um he, he, he has confirmation bias. He just is being very open about his confirmation bias. He wants these things to be true, so he's just going to try and make the evidence fit. Boyd K. Packer, right. though, and when I say... motivated reasoning, too, right? Motivated reasoning, um, cognitive uh, front-loading, I think they call it as well. Um, yeah. Some things that are true and not very useful is Boyd K. Packer's take. That's a hot take. Um, you just have to choose to believe, was what Russell M. Nelson said. Um, research is not the answer. A, and a testimony is gained or strengthened by bearing it. Okay, that's Oaks. And then when the prophet speaks, the debate is over. I mean, pause this video, take as much time as you need to digest these, but we're going to trot right along to some more problematic stuff, which I'm sure is going to make us feel even worse. <laughs> <laughs> How can you believe in extraordinary things such as angels and gold plates and your divine potential? Easy. Just look around and believe. That's all. That's all That's it all takes. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Just like we talked about last week, all you need to do to get a temple recommend, just stop smoking. Just stop it. Just stop. Mm -hmm. uh, true conversion is brought about by the conscious acceptance and commitment to follow the will of God. The banquet of consequences and blessings that flow from conversion is true and permanent peace and the personal assurance of ultimate happiness despite the storms of this life. That's Quentin Elkut. They love to say, oh, well, you can't choose the consequences. You don't get to choose the consequences. Um, they don't get to choose the consequences of their actions either. If they continue to lie, people will continue to leave the church. And hey, they, they can't burn. control that. <laughs> yes. Okay. And this one was from the most recent conference, which is why yeah. I chose it. I think it was actually in, in our halftime show, right? Mm -hmm. um, that 
this whole talk, he was redefining conversion as obedience. Mm. So now faith in the LDS church is redefined as obedience and charity is redefined as obedience and hope is redefined as obedience and Mm -hmm. conversion is redefined as obedience. So like one size fits all, I guess every virtue, every Christian virtue you want is actually a a Mm -hmm. keyword to mean obedience to LDS church leaders. Absolutely. And so you've got these five suggestions of developing faith in Jesus Christ, right? Study, then choose to believe, then act in faith, then partake of sacred ordinances, so, you know, get yourself stuck in. Then ask your Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ for help. Hmm. Yeah. I feel like asking Jesus, asking God, maybe come a bit earlier? Yeah, perhaps? yeah, it seems a little backwards to There's me. some <laughs> bookending to be done, very possibly. Um, okay, so let's have a look at what Lewis would say to all this. Okay. Help us feel better, Lewis. Yeah, right. So, Christ was... N- it never meant that we were to remain children in intelligence. On the contrary, he told us to be not only as harmless as doves, but also as wise as serpents. He wants a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. He wants us to be simple, single-minded, affectionate, and teachable, as good children are. But he also wants every bit of intelligence we have to be alert as at its job and in first-class fighting trim. The fact that you are giving money to a charity does not mean that you need not try to find out whether the charity is a fraud or not. <laughs> Can every member of the church please take this advice? To heart? <laughs> and That's if you're excellent. giving money to a charity, please find out whether it is a fraud or not. <laughs> oh, I That love is this just quote. excellent. I feel like I've heard the exact opposite in quotes from General Conference where where leaders have told members to actually be childlike, to actually mm-hmm. remain children, to to mm-hmm. stop. Um, like in, in Jeffrey R. Holland's talk uh, from the, the same session that we did the um, halftime join, he was mm-hmm. really infantilizing towards the members and saying like oh all you have to do is just stay at the feast and eat your eat your broccoli even though you don't like it and i'm like the infantilization of members in the church is one of the most widespread trends uh trend i don't know if trend is the right word because Mm -hmm. it's not it's not as trendy as you are anymore but um the children in intelligence is a mainstay for for Mm -hmm. church leaders they need members to be children in intelligence because if they come to have grown-ups heads then they start to ask those hard questions and Mm -hmm. dang it if they don't usually leave but then lewis has an answer for this he says i'm not asking anyone to accept christianity if his best reasoning tells him that the weight of evidence is against it that is not the point at which faith comes in but supposing a man's reason once decides that the weight of evidence is for it there will come a moment when all at once his emotions will rise up and carry out a sort of blitz on his belief. Faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods, for moods will change whatever view your reason takes. This is another quote that is used by um, by church leaders and, and also lay members because it feels like something that should uh, be supporting their worldview they're saying Mm. like you know once you've accepted that the church is true then you just have to stick to it you just have to endure to the end you just have to keep doing all the things until you die and Mm -hmm. until all of your kids are grown up and are also doing all of those things um and i i think that we in the member mindset we kind of curtail this idea to be about consistently doing something that we thought was true as children. And if it's separated from Lewis's ideas about intelligence and using our intelligence and using our intellectual capacities to challenge the norms mm-hmm. and to and to pursue the, the logical arguments that we're given, if we separate those things, then it becomes uh, a, a kind of reinforcement for cult-like behavior. Mm. Uh, when it is combined with the rest of what Lewis says though, and even in this quote itself, we see that like he's not he's not saying do whatever you decided to do a long time ago even if it doesn't make sense anymore mm-hmm. he's saying that there is value to faith we all have to show faith at some mm-hmm. point because we just literally can't understand everything 
Um, but that the the time that we use faith uh, will vary based on our age, our context, mm -hmm. how much we know about things, our, our access to historical materials. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I continue to love Lewis, even as a post-Mormon, because I think he's very generous towards people who are attempting to use their logical and intellectual processes to figure mm -hmm. things out. That he's not saying Christianity is right at all costs and everyone else is, is damned. He's mm -hmm. saying, like, do your best to figure this out. And this is what has made sense to me. And this is how it's made sense to me. But he's mm -hmm. very generous towards people um, uh for whom it doesn't make sense yet. And it's this beginning bit that I was never encouraged to do, um, and I'm still never encouraged to do really, is this best reasoning, you, you're making a decision first of all, because there's no real decision in, in LDS dialogue around whether the church is true or not. There's no decision to be made, there's just a truth to be found, supposedly. There's, there's no decision there. So the weight of evidence will always lead you one way, so therefore your faith should get going from day one because someone else is already telling you the answer. So your faith is there for it. But actually what Lewis is teaching and what I would agree with is that he's essentially saying, work it out. Then once you've worked it out, use faith to sustain you when it gets difficult to act on what you've discovered. Yes. Whatever that which might is, be, religious Which is or very not. applicable in the post-Mormon context mm -hmm. as well. That um, you also have to make decisions and kind of say, like, I know this is damaging, and so I'm not going to do it even if I miss some of my friends at, mm -hmm. at church. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for adding that. I think, I think he's brilliant. So uh, here's the next quote. Thirst was made for water, inquiry for truth. Beautiful. Very beautiful. And this is like, I love about Lewis that he's so quotable. That's what a lot of people love about him. Mm -hmm. He has so many just perfectly quippy lines. And this is one of them because in, in the LDS context, in the TBM mindset, um, we have a natural resistance or not a natural, but a conditioned resistance towards asking certain questions. Um, and I love that Lewis validates all the questions, you know, keep asking those questions because we were given the ability to ask questions so that we could find answers. That's what keeps humanity rolling forward. Mm. And I think uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I've i lucked out on Bishop Roulette. I, I have a lot, of, a lot of time for my bishop. I think my bishop's a great guy. Um, and we have a lot of discussions and he, he lets me ask a lot of questions. Maybe it's because he's a philosophy professor. You know, that might help. But he's very good at just letting me ask the questions and reasoning it out. And actually having a, a debate and going down these rabbit holes and trying to work it out because it's tricky. And I think to your point near the beginning that you made about Lewis, it should be difficult. Christianity isn't a thing you just kind of do that you're just like, ah, oh, okay. If, if it's a value system you're going to adopt, it takes work, it takes effort. You've got to put something into it. Your value system in life should take effort, should take work and consistency, whatever that might be, whether that's Christian whether or whether it's non-religious. Your value system is something that you should be looking at and constantly evaluating and working on. And I think Lewis hits that really nicely here. Yes. And uh, and he even has a word for that too. He calls it the the Tao in honor of the, the, the mm -hmm. Tao Te Ching um, because he acknowledges that like there is a system of morality that influences almost all of us uh whether or not we consider ourselves christians mm -hmm. or whether or not we've ever even been exposed to christianity and and i think that his the essence of his christianity is alignment with that with that like that super reality mm -hmm. that that law that says we should love one another um and, and he feels like Christianity is the way that it ma makes most sense to practice coming into alignment with that reality. Mm -hmm. But he's also um, very willing, probably more willing than any other Christian apologist to say that anyone from any religious or non-religious tradition can come into alignment with that reality and that they will also be saved. He Because mm -hmm. he, he often says like, just because we know that, um, we know that, everyone must be saved by Christ doesn't mean that everyone will call Christ by that name. Mm -hmm. um, so he sees that as like the, the overall law that we're all trying to come into alignment with. Mm -hmm. this, I want to leave this final quote hanging in the air because I, I want people to hear it, really just hear it because it seems harsh, 
but it's so important. He says, a sane man accepts or rejects any statement, not because he wants to or does not want to, but because the evidence seems to him good or bad. If he were mistaken about the goodness or badness of the evidence, that would not mean he was a bad man, but only that we were not very clear or it were not very clear to him. If clever. he thought the evidence... Oh, no, you were not misspelled. very clever. You- yep. Oh, no, no, I just misread it. Okay, but only that we're not very clever. If he, <clears throat> if he thought the evidence bad, but tried to force himself to believe in spite of it, that would be merely stupid. So, it doesn't make you a bad person to realise you are wrong. It doesn't make you a bad person to realise that the evidence isn't what you thought it was, or the evidence isn't um, as strong as you thought it was. It doesn't make you a bad person. But it would be foolish to continue to try and view it as good if you've realised it's not. Yes. And give yourself the space and the freedom to accept the new evidence and move on. That would be my my hope for anyone reading that quote. Yeah, sorry about the typo. It, yeah, I'm the sorry. end of that line is, but only that he were not very we clever. Um, yeah. And and I agree. And I also think that this probably doesn't give enough weight to, to cult mind control either, that um, there are a lot of very intelligent people in the in in the space where they have seen good evidence and rejected mm. it based on their conditioning um and that doesn't make them stupid but it, it does make them more uh they it means that they see continuing in their current context as safer for them um than challenging that mm. context uh so i think there could be a bit of, of nuance there but i love how um how starkly Lewis sees it. It's kind of refreshing to hear it. Mm, absolutely. So I'm just a bit distracted. Someone seems to want to report me to my state president in the chat. It's all it's all happening. Okay. So um, here's some brief other comparisons uh, of Lewisian Christianity. Um, um, any if you'd like, we can, we can just here? leave this here because yeah. I think that the comparisons are pretty obvious uh, based okay. on the bolded. Hearts. So we're going to strike a cool pose like this. Other way. <laughs> oh, for long? Yeah, there you go. And then <laughs> um, people can pause and watch that and they'll have a cool little picture of me and Laura in the corner. So okay. pause, read these um, other comparisons on Christianity. That would be excellent. Right. Okay. Next slide. So let's get down to it. What were Lewis's perceptions of Mormonism? We've already read the kind of the quote uh, from the letter that he replied to that woman where he thought it was a, a crime to yes. <laughs> require teetotalism. Tyrannical. It was tyrannical. tyrannical. Yes. So uh, the idea okay, that people so aren't at the pub. Is, this is from, these quotes are from his novel at the end of his sci-fi trilogy. Um, it is kind of a trippy trilogy and it's definitely not kid safe. Do not read these books out loud to your kids. They get kind of gory at times. Uh, but this character in the last of the books called Strake, the character is called Strake, I think is a pretty good representation of how Lewis saw sects like Mormonism. That's S-E-C-T-S, right? Um, mm-hmm. Sects like Mormonism would be perceived in this way from Lewis's vantage point. Um, and since we as LDS members tend to be uh, kind of kind of curious about like how other Christians see us all the time, I thought it was worth um, including these, but we can also just uh, mm-hmm. cool pose this one and, and move No, 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 I'll, like. I'll, I'll have a quick read of this real quick. Okay, okay. Um, but the, uh, the name Strake, correct? Strake, yeah. Okay. The least satisfactory member of the circle in Mark's eyes was Strake. Strake made no effort to adapt himself to the ribbard and realistic tone in which his colleagues spoke. He never drank nor smoked. He would sit silent, nursing a threadbare knee with a lean hand and turning his large unhappy eyes from one speaker to another without attempting to combat them or join them in the joke when they laughed. Then, perhaps once in the whole evening, something said would start him off. Usually something about the opposition of reactionaries in the outer world and the measure with which the nice would take to deal with it. 
At such moments, he would burst into loud and prolonged speech, threatening, denouncing, prophesying. Sometimes, Strake addressed him in particular, talking to Mark's great discomfort and bewilderment about resurrection. Neither historical fact nor a fable, young man, but a prophecy. All the miracles, shadows of things to come, get rid of false spirituality. It is all going to happen here in this world, in the only world there is. It was all very unpleasant. Do you do you want to carry on, or is that enough? Oh, I, I thought maybe I should provide a little bit of extra yeah. context in, mm-hmm. in that this book is a, a kind of a treatise on the abolition of man. Not a treatise, sorry. Um, it, it's his fictional version of the abolition of man. Mm-hmm. And what he is particularly focusing on is the toxic and intoxicating influence of inner circles. Um, Mm -hmm. Because the whole book is structured around this main character, Mark, as Mark gets sucked into progressively more inner circles of this NICE Institute. Mm -hmm. It's the um, National Institute of of something I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, But the the clear thing about this institute is that it's pretty corrupt and -hmm. it's called the NICE and it's based on these inner rings. So everyone who's at the Institute is like part part of the Institute. They're in the outermost ring. But then there's a, an, an inner group that's like the elites at the mm-hmm. ring. And then within that group, there's a group of just like three or four people who are the, the like ultra elites. And mm-hmm. you'll see from Mormonism that Mormonism is structured very much the same way. There's like the world, but then there are the members and then there are the leaders and then there are the general leaders and then there are the first presidency. Um, and so the, the rings just get smaller and smaller and it's very intoxicating to, to especially characters like Mark who want to be in the know, who, mm. who want to be someone important. Um, and so he's getting sucked into these inner rings and he starts encountering people like this Strake and the entire, the entire book and especially this character Strake seem to be a pretty uh, poignant view into how Lewis saw uh, religious groups like Mormonism. Mormonism. Okay, well, we'll strike a cool pose because if you want okay. to hear me read any more Lewis like this, you'll have to pay for me to do the audiobook. <laughs> All right. Okay, so striking a cool pose like this. Cool. Right, so feel free to read off the rest of it. Okay. Beware of plagiarism. Ooh. Okay, what's going on here? What is going on here? So in 1952, um, Lewis gave the Mere Christianity lectures through the BBC um, Mm -hmm. and then subsequently published Mere Christianity. Uh, In 1989, Ezra Taft Benson gave his very famous Beware of Pride speech, and I forgot to get it out, but I actually have his Beware of Pride speech that I took on my mission that was formatted in columns as if it were scripture. Like that's nice. how seriously, um, at least mm-hmm. missionaries in my district, we're taking this talk. Yeah. And um, what we we don't really, are, what we aren't really aware of uh, as members of the church is that there are very strong indications of plagiarism uh, from Lewis in this talk. Um, I also taught rhetorical analysis and English at um, BYU for my master's program. And mm-hmm. these are the signs that we would look for when we were looking for plagiarism or okay. were similarities of verbiage that were kind of unusual for that mm-hmm. person to be using. So like it would only show up in these specific phrases that were just like the source material or the repetition of unique ideas mm-hmm. that were repeated in almost the same way from the source material to, to the new the new writing. And what you see when you're comparing um, the like the words of Lewis from Mere Christianity and the words of Ezra Taft Benson almost third, like what is that? 35 years later, 37 years mm-hmm. later, um, 37 years later is that there are very strong parallels in the verbiage and the ideas coming through in Benson's talk. Mm-hmm. Now to give Benson credit, he does quote Lewis in the middle of his talk. He has a direct quote from Lewis. But all of these that I have listed on the screen are not credited. So mm-hmm. even though he does credit Lewis in the middle of his talk, he he tries to bulk up the other the two sides of the talk so that it looks like he's mostly quoting from scriptures and other that, places. That, and that only these serves are to strengthen. Ideas. Only serves to strengthen the link because by quoting Lewis directly, he makes it very clear that he has been reading Lewis. Yes. And so therefore, yes. you can so see where these ideas that. are coming from. 
right? Mm-hmm. So, you, so the argument would be, well, he'd never read Lewis in his life. Well, no, no, because he quoted him in this talk. Yes. So oh, he that's clearly a good point. Is aware. Yeah. He's clearly aware that he's around. Okay, so are there any of these that really stand out to you that you want to cover? Because people can do pause and read. I like this pause and read format. It saves my voice. Um, do you want to just pick some at random? I have them lined up mm. so that they're with their their um their biggest corollaries. Maybe just mm-hmm. the first two and the last one or something. Yeah, okay. So the first two. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The please, The pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone. That's what Lewis said in 1952. Mm -hmm. Benson said, pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit our will against God's. Hmm. Okay. But pride always means enmity. It is enmity. uh, It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. Our enmity towards God takes on many labels. Sin of pride is enmity towards our fellow men. Again, this that idea is very, very the, similar. I think this was the only place he used enmity in the talk. And so that's, you know, a significant point that like it parallels the... The only other... <laughs> this is going to upset some viewers, I'm sure. The only other place I can think of the word enmity being used in LDS discussion is in the temple. Mm-hmm. And Satan says, and with that enmity, I will, I will buy armies and navies, right? You know that diatribe he goes on. Um, uh-huh. He probably gets angry. That I was like, oh, what's that word? I've never heard that word before. It'd be interesting if anyone knows. Can they track when the word enmity was first introduced to the endowment? Mm, that would be interesting. I don't know whether that it happened. is post Lewis. Maybe yeah. it would be interesting to see. Um, okay, and then we'll go with the last one as well. Um, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done. Ezra Taft Benson says, when we direct our pride towards God, it's in the spirit of my will and not thine be done. Yeah, so it's a very similar concept there again. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so read the rest of them. Read the whole, um, the whole talk from Benson mm-hmm. and then read Mere Christianity because I th- I think like after reading them one after the other I was like all of the best parts of this talk came from <laughs> all of the other Excellent. parts of Benson's talk are kind of wordy they're like rambling they're kind of ragey and like ah just give me the Lewis okay <laughs> just give me the Lewis leave everything else yeah leave it all else nice so we've got here from Ruth Heath, if only the prophet could have fresh material for his talks instead of reading the children's books section at the local library. Okay, yeah. I see what you're saying. Oh, someone's saying the word enmity in that context used in the Old Testament, Genesis uh, 3.15. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Great to see. Um, so oh, other people just discussing my standing in the church. So the answer to the <laughs> question... <laughs> the answer to the question, Laura, what is the answer to the question? So at least uh, from my reading of Lewis and of studying the Mormon prophets, I'd say a resounding no, that mm. Lewis considered himself a Christian, that Mormonism clearly did not meet his definition of Christianity, uh, but that individual members could have been considered Christian by Lewis. Mm -hmm. I think he would have recognized them as Christian because there are a lot of members who do um, take actions in alignment with the Christianity that Lewis is describing. Mm. Um, However, I would also say that the actions those members are taking is probably largely inspired and justified by Lewis Mm -hmm. as quoted by general authorities and that the major strain of Christianity that is still strong in the church and that people like Peter Bleakley are talking about in, Mm -hmm. in his podcast, that that strain of Christianity um, either substantially came from or was substantially bolstered by Mm -hmm. apologetics such as those from Lewis. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So let me Um, pull Yeah. So this is my, my afterward that I, I'm taking the position of Lewis for this uh, whole presentation. And I do really adore uh, Lewis. I think he's so interesting and insightful. However, this is not to say like this, this presentation is not an argument in favor of 
Lewisian logic overall, mm -hmm. and it's also not in favor of Christianity overall, that those are different questions. I can see problems with Lewis's logic in other places. This is mm -hmm. just the comparison between the way that Lewis presents Christianity and the way that the LDS church preaches and practices Christianity mm. and how those, how those uh, contradict each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you've just got up here on the right oh. many post-mormons have difficulty bridging conversations with their friends or family after they have deconstructed mormonism which often includes deconstructing christianity lewis offers ground for a reasonable person to talk about morality and religion without the assumption of blind faith becoming conversant in terms of lewisian christianity offers great potential for navigating post-mormon relationships with still believing loved ones is that your so takeaway? This is uh, this is not something I have actively tried because I had already kind of overexposed a lot of my family members by mm -hmm. the time um, I was getting into these comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine that for for people who are deconstructing and looking for a way to talk to their believing loved ones, but they don't want to send them the letter about mm -hmm. all of the all of the false history and stuff that they were taught growing up, um, this is a great this is a great place to start that, to start um, kind of softly introducing um, topics of a spiritual nature um, with, with a text that an LDS member can feel validated by, mm -hmm. but also safely challenge because an LDS member doesn't have to feel beholden to Lewis in terms of all of his doctrine. And so you can help your family members start to like exercise their critical thinking by reading Lewis together, by doing book clubs together, by doing whatever you need to, and going through the the logic of Lewis's Christianity, which would largely um, which would largely affirm and validate an LDS member's perspective on yeah. those things too. Excellent. One final quote from the man himself. Then, I have learned now that while those who speak about one's miseries usually hurt. Those who keep silence hurt more. Mm, I love this quote. Um, I think this is really relevant to the post-Mormon context because so many of us struggle with knowing how to talk and whether to talk and in like in what tone to take when we're talking about, uh, about problems with the church. And I think that something Lewis modeled with his life is that he just started talking and he tried to stay authentic to his experiences and, and mm. say it like he saw it. And he gave the best arguments that he could um, for atheism. And he also gave the best arguments he could for Christianity. I mean, this is a man who really knew deconstruction from the inside out. He had mm. to do it twice. Um, I think that he would have done it again um, if he had lived longer, because a lot of the biblical criticism and things that he based his logic on was challenged in the subsequent decades to, to mm. his death. Um, and so I think one of the important takeaways for the post-Mormon communities um, from from Lewis is that like you don't have to have it all figured out. You can use your experience. Be be gentle with your readers. Be generous with your readers. Steal man the other side's arguments and let your experience speak for itself because your experience is powerful. Um, and a lot of Lewis's writings still resonate today because he was so authentic to his experience and to his understanding of Christianity. He wasn't just regurgitating what everyone else was saying. Um, and in the ways that it did parallel what other people were saying, it he, he justified it in his own way, with his own words, with his own panache. And mm -hmm. those are the things that make him really resonant, even though some of his ideas are outdated now. Mm. That's my closing there bit. we go that's your closing bit okay well thank you very much everybody for tuning in thank you so much laura for this i'm really excited to explore more lewis in the future i think it's gonna be awesome um because the people of people are asking for it so i think it would be rude to deny them um and i'm really interested to read some lewis i think it would be great so uh, Definitely let's do some read. of that let's do some <laughs> of that um but thank you very much i think lewis is a great place to to talk to believing family members from um, and, you know, for those who are in the church still and are struggling to find a way to get through, there is that base ground that Lewis can offer folks that um, want to have that slightly more nuanced approach. He offers some of that for you. So um, go out there, read some Lewis. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think of the Lewis. Drop me emails. Let me know what you think. Uh, and if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up because, you know, it's always nice. Someone gives you a thumbs up. Mahan Rai, give you, a thumb up. you can give me a thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> right, everyone, have a great evening. Take care. Bye now.